Okay guys, so we're going to hop back into Chains. This is chapter 3, starting out with another primary source. Monday, May 27th, 1776. Runaway from the subscriber living at number 110 Water Street, near the New Slip. A Negro girl named Paul, about 13 years of age, very black, marched, marked with the smallpox, and had on when she went away a red cloth petticoat and a light blue short gown, homemade. Whoever will take up and secure the said girl so that the owner may get her shall be handsomely rewarded. And this is from a newspaper advertisement in the Royal Gazette in New York. So it's going to be pretty common to be looking in newspapers um, at this time and have people who enslaved other people searching for these freedom fighters, these people that wanted to escape and live their life to the best of what everyone should be able to do. And they're going to use descriptions depending on their clothing, depending on um, what sort of marks they have. So we talked last time a little bit about smallpox, how it might make scars on your face. And so that's one of the ways that they're describing this freedom fighter who was able to escape. So here we go. Let's hop in. The snake took us to Miss Mary's house to collect our blankets and two small shoes, but nothing else. We couldn't take Mama's shells, nor Ruth's baby doll, made of flannel bits and calico, nor the wooden bowl Papa made for me. Nothing belonged to us. As I folded the blankets, Mr. Robert went out to the privy. Privy's the bathroom. And remember, they don't have um, running water at this point, so it's going to be a hole that, that um, most likely an enslaved person had to dig, and they're going to put a little privacy um, wooden building around it. And from time to time, they're going to need to um, redig the privy, so they're going to just keep moving the location of the bathroom. There was no point in grabbing Ruth and running. He had a horse and a gun, and we were known to all. I looked around our small room, searching for a tiny piece of home I could hide in my pocket. What to take? Seeds. On the hearth stood the jar of flower seeds that Mama had collected, seeds that she never had a chance to put in the ground. I didn't know what they'd grow into. I didn't know if they'd grow at all. It was a fanciful notion, but I uncorked the jar, snatched a handful, and buried it deep in my pocket, just as the privy door creaked open. As the wagon drove us away, Ruth turned to see the little house disappear. I pulled her into my lap and stared straight ahead, afraid that if I looked back, I might break. By midday we were in Newport, following Mr. Robert up the steps of Sullivan's Tavern. I have never been inside a tavern before. It was a large room, twice as big as Miss Mary's house house, with two wide fireplaces, one on each of the far walls. The room was crowded with tables and chairs and as many people as church on Easter Sunday, except church was never cloudy with tobacco smoke, nor the smell of roast beef. Most of the customers were men, and a few had their wives with them. Some seemed like regular country folk, but others wore rich clothes not useful for muck shoveling. They made haste, tucking into their dinners, playing cards, paging newspapers, and arguing loud about the British soldiers and their navy and taxes and a war. Ruth didn't like the noise and covered her ears with her hands. I pulled her towards me and patted her on the back. Ruth was simple-minded and prone to fits, which spooked ignorant folk. Noise could bring them on as well as a state of nervous excitement. She was in the middle of both. So we know that Ruth has um, fits which we're going to see a little bit later resemble um, epilepsy, like if you have a seizure or some sort of a um, condition like that. But she also has um, a different way of seeing the world. She's going to be seeing it in a much younger way, and so her older sister is going to be trying to take care of her. And in history, at times, people are going to look at people with different um, differences, and they're going to think that there's something wrong with them. So we're going to be looking towards how do people interact with Ruth, and how do they um, account for her differences. Instead of seeing them as strengths or just something different, like we're all different, they're going to look very um, harshly on that. Okay? As I patted, her eyes grew wide at the sight of a thick slice of buttered bread perched near the edge of a table. We hadn't eaten all day, and there had been little food the day before, which was what, with Miss Mary dying, I snatched her hand away as she reached for it. Soon, I whispered. Mr. Robert pointed to a spot in the corner. Stand there, he ordered. A woman burst through the kitchen door carrying a tray heavy with food. She was a big woman, twice the size of my mother, with milky skin and freckles. She looked familiar and caused me to search my remembering. We have 
Jenny fatten up the British Navy and make their ship sink to the bottom of the sea, yelled a red-faced man. The big woman, Jenny, laughed as she set a bowl in front of the man. The proprietor called her over to join us. She frowned as she approached, giving Ruth and me a quick once-over, while tucking a stray curl under her cap. These are the girls, Mr. Robert explained. It don't matter, the proprietor said as he put his hand on Jenny's back. We don't hold with slaves being auctioned on our front steps. Won't stand for it, in fact. I thought this was a business establishment, Mr. Robert said. Are you opposed to earning your percentage? You want to listen to my bill, mister, Jenny said. Advertise in the paper. That's what we do around here. I don't have time for that. These are fine girls. They'll go quickly. Give me half an hour's time on your front steps, and we both walk away with a heavier pocket. Jenny's husband pulled out a rag and wiped his hands on it. Auctions of people ain't seemly. Why don't you just talk quiet-like to folks, or leave a notice tacked up? That's proper. I recall an auction not twenty yards from here, Mr. Roberts said. One of the brown ships brought up a load of rum and slaves from the islands. They must have sold thirty-five, forty people in two hours' time. Rhode Island don't import slaves. Not for two years now, Jenny said. All the more reason why folks want to buy what I have to sell. I want this done quickly. I have other business to tend to. Is that our problem, Bill? Jenny asked her husband. He says that like it's our problem. Ease off, Jenny, Bill said. The girls look hungry. Why don't you take them to the kitchen? Jenny looked like she had plenty more to say to Mr. Roberts, but she gave Ruth and me a quick glance and said, Follow me. Mr. Roberts grabbed my shoulder. They've already eaten. No charge, Jenny said evenly. I like feeding children. Oh, Mr. Robert released me. Well then, that's different. So we know that it costs money for food and that Mr. Roberts is not interested in seeing um, Ruth and her sister as actual humans, that he doesn't want to pay for food. They haven't eaten at all. Um, one thing that I got to see when I was in Colonial Williamsburg this past summer, I went on a private tour with Mr. Daly and some other folks, and they took us into one of the houses and they showed us some shackles, so some chains that people would use to to tie, tie people, they're metal. And one of the things that just um, broke my heart and I was just so sad was just seeing the ones they showed us were made for children. So it was regular enough to be um, having children that were enslaved that they would have specifically made chains for children. Um, and so for us today, we might be looking at that um, through our tw 2020 you know, mind frame thinking, wow, that's really odd. But at this time period, we know that that she's that Jenny is telling us that for two years they've not been imp importing slaves. So there are going to be some locations that are starting to um, fight for um, enslaved people, trying to um, support um, their freedom. But there are going to be other places that are still going to be trying to keep people enslaved. And so um, it's interesting how she phrases, I like to feed children to just point out that they are children. Oh, there's Miss Sophia barking. Um, and that's just one of the things I love throughout this book. We're going to see people um, talk about these freedom fighters, these people that are enslaved, and we're going to start to see um, that it's not just one black or white, like that people support slavery or that they don't, that they're all just existing in this time period making the best decisions that they can. So we're going to keep going and um, see what happens. Jenny closed the kitchen door behind her and motioned for Ruth and me to sit at the table in the middle of the room. A cauldron of stew hung above the fire in the hearth, and two fresh pies were cooling by the window. Eat first, she said, then talk. She cut us slices of brown bread and ham and poured us both big mugs of cider. Ruth gulped her down quick and held out her mug for more. Jenny smiled and refilled it. I made short work of the food, keeping one eye on the door in case Mr. Robert walked in. The back door to the kitchen was wide open to let in the breeze. Should I grab Ruth's hand and try to escape? Jenny read my mind. No sense running. She shook her head from side to side. He'd find you right away. I scowled at my bread and took another bite. I'd help you if I could, she said. It'd be the least I could do for Dinah. I wasn't sure I'd heard her right. Pardon me, ma'am? You're Dinah's girl. Knew you when you walked in the door. You knew my mother? Jenny stirred the cauldron of stew. Your mother and father both. I held you when you were just a day old. I heard she passed away last year. My condolences. She cut two pieces from the apple pie and gave them to Ruth and me. I was indentured when I was your age. So, um, indentured is when you 
agree to work for someone for a certain number of years, and enslaved means that you are um, owned for life. Unless your owner frees you, there is no possibility for freedom, whereas with an indentured person, they are going to have a specific contract for the number of years they agree to work. Um, there are going to be many times that we can trace through the laws that were created that um, indentured folks and enslaved people are going to at times try to escape together. And um, so that's one of the reasons that Jenny is going to be more kind towards them and understanding because she knows what it's like to be, um, to be um, in a sense, owned by someone or being able to have somebody telling them what to do all the time. Old Mr. Malborn had five of us from Ireland, along with near thirty slaves, worked us all just as hard, but after seven years I could walk away, thank the Lord. Dinah was real friendly to me when I got there, helped me to get used to a new place and people ordering me around. I thought I knew you, I said. She smiled warmly and snatched a piece of apple from the pie plate. You always were the best rememberer I ever saw. We used to make a game of it, tell you a line to memorize or a song. Didn't matter how much time passed, you'd have the whole thing in your mouth made your parents proud. A servant girl came through the door, and talk stopped. Once Jenny had loaded up her tray and sent her back out, she sat down next to me. How did you come to be with that man, she asked. I thought you were at Mrs. Finch's place. I quickly explained the dizzy events of the last two days. There's no telling what happened to the lawyer, Jenny said when I finished. Boston is a terrible confusion, first the King's army, and now Washington's. What could I do, I asked. The words came out louder than they should have. Gently covered my mouth. Jenny gently covered my mouth with her hand. Shh, she warned. You gotta use your head. I grabbed her hand. Can you take us, please? You knew Mama. She slowly pulled her hand from mine, shaking her head. I'm sorry, Isabel. I dare not. But Bill opened the door and poked his head in. He wants the girls. Best hurry. A thin woman stood next to Mr. Roberts. Her plum-colored gown was crisp and well-sewn. An expensive lace trailed from the cap on her head. She was perhaps five and forty years, with pale eyebrows and small eyes like apple seeds. A fading yellow bruise encircled her right wrist like a bracelet. She looked us over quickly. Sisters? Two for the price of one, Mr. Roberts said. Hardest working girls you'll ever own. What's wrong with them? The woman said bluntly. Why such a cheap price? Mr. Roberts' snake smile widened. My haste is your good fortune, madam. These girls were servants of my late aunt, whose passing I mourn deeply. I must quickly conclude the matters of her estate. The recent unrest, you know. A man joined the woman, his eyes suspicious and flinty. He wore a red silk waistcoat under a snuff-colored coat with silver buttons, a starch linen shirt, and black breeches. The buckles on his boots were as big as my fists. And what side do you take in the current situation, sir? he asked. Are you for the king, or do you support rebellion? Conversation at nearby tables stopped as people listened in. I pledge myself to our rightful sovereign, the king, sir, Mr. Robert said. Washington and his rabble may have taken Boston, but that's the last thing they'll take. The stranger gave a little bow and introduced himself. Elihu Lockton at your service, sir. This is my wife, Anne. So people are going to be really careful showing what side they support. Um, depending on where the armies are, who knows who, it's really dangerous to reveal because you don't know who's going to support what side. But apparently in this tavern with these people, he felt safe enough to um, say that he supported the king. So very interesting. Mr. Robert bowed politely in return, ignoring the muttering at the table behind him. May I offer you both some sup and drink that we might be better acquainted? They all sat and Jenny swooped over to take their orders. Ruth and I stood with their backs against the wall as Mr. Robert and the Locktons ate and drank. I watched them close. The husband was a head taller and twice the girth of most men. His shoulders rounded forward and his neck seemed to pain him, for he often reached up to rub it. He said he was a merchant with business in Boston, New York, and Charleston, and complained about how much Boston, the Boston uprising cost him. His missus sipped Jenny's chowder, shuddered at the taste, and reached for her mug of small beer. She stole glances at us from time to time. I could not figure what kind of mistress she would be. In truth, I was struggling to think straight. The air in the tavern had grown heavy, and the weight of the day pressed against my head. When the men took out their pipes and lit their tobacco, Ruth sneezed, and the company all turned and considered us. Well, then, Lockton said, pushing back from the table to give his belly some room, the wife is looking for a serving wench. Mrs. Lockton crooked a finger at us. Come here, girls. I took Ruth by the hand and stepped within reach. 
Mrs. Lockton studied our hands and arms, looked at our feet, and made us take off our kerchiefs and look in our hair for knits. Like, um, the, oh my gosh, lice, like little lice babies. They want to, she's checking to see if they're there. Can you cook, she finally asked me. Not much, ma'am, I admitted. Just as well, she said. I don't need another cook. What do you do? I put my arm around Ruth. We can scrub your house, clean, care for cows and pigs, work your garden, and carry just about anything. My aunt trained them up herself, Mr. Robert added, and they come with blankets and shoes. Locked inside. Why not wait, Anne, and procure another indentured girl in New York? His wife sat back as Jenny arrived with coffee. Indentured servants complain all the time and steal us blind at the first opportunity. I'll never hire another. Jenny set the tray on the table so hard the cups rattled in their saucers. Lockton reached for a plate of apple pie. Are you sure we need two? These are uncertain times, dear. Mrs. regarded Ruth. This loan looks simple. Is she addle-pated? Ruth gave a shy smile. I spoke before Mr. Roberts could open his mouth. She's a good simple ma'am. Does what she's told. In truth, she's a harder worker than me. Give her a broom and tell her to sweep and you'll be able to eat off the floor. Jenny poured a cup of coffee and set it in front of the missus, spilling a little on the table. She's prettier than you, Mrs. said, and she knows how to hold her tongue. She turned to her husband. The little one might be an amusement in the parlor. The big one could help Becky with the firewood and housekeeping. Jenny pressed her lips tight together and poured coffee for Lockton and Mr. Robert. Mrs. bent close to Ruth's face. I do not brook foolishness, she said. Ruth shook her head from side to side. No foolin', she said. The missus cocked her head to one side and stared at me. And you? You are to address me as madam. I expect obedience at all times. Insolence will not be tolerated, not one bit, and you will curb your tendency to talk. Yes, ma'am, madam, I stuttered. What do you say, Anne, Lockton said. We sail with the tide. I want these girls, husband, madam said. It is providence that put them in our path. How much do you want for them, Lockton asked. Mr. Robert named his price. Our price. Two for one, us being sold like bolts of faded cloth or chipped porridge bowls. Wait, Jenny announced loudly. I'll, I'll take them. The table froze. A person like Jenny did not speak to folks like the Lockton or Mr. Robert in that manner. So there's that social status. Remember that triangle we built with the king at the top and then the gentleman and then everyone else? So Jenny, as an indentured servant that's been freed, she's still in that lower, lower part. So she's not allowed to, to address them like that. Lockton stared at her as if she had grown a second head. I beg your pardon? Jenny set the kettle on the table, stood straight, and wiped her palms on her skirt. I want them two girls. I need the help. We'll pay cash. Keep to your kitchen, woman. Madam Lockton's words came out sharp and loud. Did she change her mind? Will she really take us? Work in the tavern wouldn't be bad. Maybe, and Jenny would be kind to Ruth. I could ask around about lawyer Cornell's papers. When we found Miss Mary's will, I'd work extra to pay Jenny back for the money we cost her, fair and square. Ruth and me would stay together, and we'd stay clo here, close to Mama. Please, God, please, God. Leave us, Lockton said to Jenny, and send your husband over. Jenny ignored him. It'll take us a couple days to get your money together, she said to Mr. Robert. We'll give you free lodging in the meantime. Mr. Robert's eyes darted between the two bitters. Ruth yawned. I closed my fingers behind my back. Please, God, please, God, please. Madame Lockton flicked crumbs on the floor with her handkerchief. Dear husband, she said, these girls are a bargain at double the price. With your permission, might we increase our offer twofold? Lockton picked his teeth. As long as we can conclude this business quickly. Madame stared at Jenny. Can you top that offer? Jenny wiped her hands on her apron, silent. Well, Madame Lockton demanded. Jenny shook her head. I cannot pay more. She bobbed a little curtsy. My husband will tally your account. She hurried for the kitchen door. Mr. Robert chuckled and reached for his pie. Well, then, we had a little auction here after all. Such impudence is disturbing, Lockton said. This is why we need the king's soldiers to return. He pulled out a small sack and counted out the coins to pay for us. I thank you, sir, for the meal and the transaction. You may deliver the girls to Hart's Horn, if you please. Come now, Anne. Madame Lockton stood, and the men went with her. Good day to you, sir. Safe voyage, ma'am, Mr. Robert replied. As the Locktons made their way through the crowded room, Mr. Robert dropped the heavy coins into a worn velvet bag. The thudding sound made as 
they made as they fell to the bottom reminded me of clods of dirt raining down on a fresh coffin. Ruth put her arm around my waist and leaned against me. So something to note in that is that um, Madam locked in. She doesn't control the money. She can ask her husband to up the bid, but she can't just um, do it on her own. So even though if we're looking at that pyramid of social status, even though she's up there, even within that relationship, she is still um, beholden to her husband for that money. She still has power, but it's, it's controlled in a way. All right, we're going to read Chapter 4. Monday, May 27th, Wednesday, May 29th, 1776. What a fine affair it would be if we could flit across the Atlantic, as they say the angels do from planet to planet. And this is a letter from a letter of, from John Adams to his wife, Abigail. It took two nights and two days for the Hartsborn to sail from Newport to the city of New York. Ruth and me were outside below the packet boat's deck with six sheep, a pen of hogs, three families from Scotland, and fifty casks of dried cod. At the far end of the hold were crates of goods stamped Lockton and foot, and casks of rum with the same marking. I spent most of the voyage bent double over a puke bucket, bringing up every scrap of fruit and swallow of brackish water I choked down. So remember brackish? That was one of our vocab words, so salty. And then um, remember the um, slot bucket from Blood on the River um, on the way from England to Jamestown? So they're still going to have that there so people can use the bathroom on the boat and that they can um, use it when they get seasick. Ruth stood on a box looking out of a porthole, counting seagulls and waves in a whisper that could barely be heard over the creaking of the hull. The seas calmed late on the second night, and I was able to walk a bit. Ruth was sound asleep in our hammock, thumb in her mouth. The hatchway to the deck was open and tempting. I climbed up the ladder slowly. The few sailors on watch saw me, but didn't say a word. The fat moon lit the water like a lantern over a looking glass. A clean, cold breeze blew from the north, pushing the ship so fast across the sea we seemed to fly. I sat on a crate facing the back end of the ship and hugged my knees to my chest. A mist of salty spray hung in the air. <laughs> There's Miss Sophia again. Um, she's, she has two squirrels in the backyard that she keeps wolfing at, so that's what's going on. The coastline of Rhode Island had long disappeared into darkness. I could not see where we came from or where we were going. Maybe the ship would spring a leak and sink. Maybe we'd be blown off course and land in a country without New York or people who bought and sold children. Maybe the wind would blow us in circles until the end of our days. I wiped the mist from my face. Mama said that ghosts couldn't move over water. That's why kidnapped Africans got trapped in the Americas. When Papa was stolen from Guinea, he said the ancestors howled and raged and sent a thunderstorm to turn the ship back around, but it was too late. The ghost couldn't cross the water to help him, so he had to make his own way in a strange place, sometimes with an iron collar around his neck. All Mama's people had been stolen, too, and taken to Jamaica, where she was born. Then she got sold to Rhode Island, and the ghosts of her parents couldn't follow and protect her, neither. They kept moving us over the water, stealing us away from our ghosts and our ancestors, who cried salty tear rivers in the sand. That's where Mama was now, wailing at the water's edge, while her girls were pulled out of sight under the white sails that cracked in the wind. Chapter 5 Wednesday, May 29, 1776 The inhabitants of New York are in general brisk and lively. It rather hurts the European eyes to see so many slaves upon the streets. There are computed between 26 and 30,000 inhabitants. The slaves make at least a fifth part of the number. Letter written by Patrick M. Robert, a Scotsman visiting New York. So in Europe, um, it's going to be a little different. Um, and so he's going to be observing what it's like um, in the colonies and what he sees. The hearts horn docked in New York the next morning. Just after a sailor brought down some old biscuits for our breakfast, I picked out the worms and tossed them through the porthole, then gave the biscuits to Ruth. Madame Lockton's voice rose above the shouting sailors. Bring those girls up, she said. A fellow missing most of his teeth stuck his head down the hatchway and waved us over to the ladder. We climbed up, shading our eyes against the bright light of day. Men of all types and colors swarmed the deck, carrying casks and chests down the gangplank, scurrying up the rigging to tend to the sails, unloading gear, loading gear, and making me feel very small and in the way. Ruth stood at my side and stared so hard, 
Her thumb fell out of her mouth. The ship was tied up at a long dock, one of many that jutted into the river. The sun sparkled off the water so strong I had to shade my eyes. Tall houses of brick and stone faced us, with rows upon rows of windows looking down at the street. They reached higher than the oldest trees back home. There were smaller buildings, too, all crowded shoulder to shoulder, with no room for a feather to pass betwixt them. We had arrived soon after a heavy rain. Soldiers splashed through the glittering puddles, toting wood, emptying wagons, carrying buckets, hither and fro, and standing about on corners, conversating with each other. Some wore uniforms and carried long muskets. Others, in homespun clothes, dragged fence posts on bar to a barricade. There were ordinary people, too, maids with baskets over their arms, moving into and out of shops, and cartmen pushing their barrows over cobblestones, calling out to each other and yelling at the dogs in their way. The working people were dressed muchly as we did out in the country. But there were a few gentry who stuck out, stuck out of the crowd like peacocks wandering in the chicken pen. Some of the working folk were black. In truth, I had never seen so many of us in one place, not even a burials. A wagon drawn by two thick-necked horses stopped just beyond the edge of the dock. Not far behind it came a beautiful carriage, drawn by two pale gold stallions, and driven by a stout man in livery with three cornered hat on his head. He clucked to the horses to walk on until he stopped behind the first wagon. The toothless sailor approached us again and pointed down to the dock where the crates and casks, stamped locked in and foot, were being stacked. That's where you belong. Don't wander off or one of them soldiers will shoot you dead. He laughed as he walked down the swaying pink. We followed with tiny steps, Ruth's hand in mine. As I stepped onto the solid dock, I stumbled. There you are, exclaimed Madame Lockton coming around the stacks of crates. Be careful with that, she said to the two deckhands carrying a fine walnut chest. That goes on the back of the carriage, not to the warehouse. The men nodded and carried the chest towards the beautiful carriage with the golden horses at the end of the dock. Pretty horses, Ruth said. A soldier at the end of the dock picked up his musket and stopped the two men carrying the walnut chest. There was a brief argument, then the sailors returned, still carrying their burden. What is this? Madame asked as they set the chest at her feet. I told you to put that on the carriage. Begging your pardon, ma'am, the sailor said, but them fellows says all cargo has to be inspected at the wharf before it enters the city. Order of some committee what's in charge here. Inspected? She lifted her chin. Those are my personal belongings. They will not be inspected by anyone. I do not permit it. Master Lockton had been half following the turn of events while supervising the unloading. At his wife's voice... As his wife's voice rose, he hurried to, to join her. "'Now, dear,' he said, "'I told you there would be some inconveniences. "'We must be accommodating. "'Look, there's Charles. "'We'll straighten this out.' A second wagon had pulled up next to the first. A round, short man rolled off it and bustled up to the Lockton's. "'What are you still doing here?' demanded the round man. "'You shouldn't have come back.' "'Lower your voice,' Charles Lockton said. "'What are the men... "'Where are the men I instructed you to bring?' The round man pulled a handkerchief out of his waistcoat pocket and wiped his face. Washington's men took them all to work on the blasted fortifications. Oh, double blast! Look there! Bellingham! An official-looking man in a somber black coat had stepped out of a building across the street and was striding towards our little group, walking stick in hand. He was followed by a thin fellow carrying a book near as big as Ruth. Behind him walked a, walked a slave boy about my height, whose arms were weighted down with a wooden contraption and a small case with a rope handle. The boy wore a floppy red hat, his shirt sleeves rolled up to his elbow, the blue breeches of a sailor, and a pair of dusty boots. "'Bellingham is eager to arrest you,' Charles quietly told Master Lockton. "'I told you it was still unsafe. You should have waited.' "'Anne,' Lockton fixed his eyes intently on his wife, "'do not fail me.' She gave a little nod. "'You have a plan?' Charles asked. "'Everything is in order,' Lockton said. "'Elihu Lockton,' Bellingham called, waving his walking stick. "'Come join us, friend.' Three more soldiers appeared and lined up a few paces behind him. "'Smile, everyone,' Lockton commanded through clenched teeth. "'Pretend to be happy rebels.' So um, Bellingham is part of the Patriots, or rebels, and they control New York. The Locktons are loyalists. They support the king. And they have to pretend to be loyal to the um, rebel sides. So we're going to see a little interesting interaction here. 
The Lockton's and Charles walked to the land end of the dock. Ruth and me followed a few steps behind. Little mice trailing behind dogs that were fixed to, fixed to fight. The boy in the red hat set down the case and fiddled with the strange wooden thing. It was actually two strange wooden things, a folding desk and a small stool. After he set up both of them, the thin fellow laid the book on the desk, opened to a blank page, and perched on the rickety stool. The boy opened the case and took out a bottle of ink and quill, which he set next to the book. He closed and latched the case, and stepped back and put his hands behind his back, eyes ahead like he was a soldier too. "'Good day, Charles,' Bellingham inclined his head towards Madam, Mrs. Lockton. Ruth started to raise her head, her hand to wave at the man, but I grabbed it and held it down. "'Mr. Bellingham,' Madam replied, "'how fares your good wife? "'Happy that summer is nearly here. "'You know how she hates the cold. "'Please tell Lorna I shall call on her as soon as we are settled,' Madam said. "'Very good,' Bellingham said. "'We thought you were in London, Elihu. "'London? "'Never!' exclaimed Lockton. "'England offers us nothing but taxes, stamps, and bloodshed. "'How odd! "'Word from Boston is that you still lick the king's boots.' "'Madam drew in her breath sharply, but said nothing.' "'Why do you insult me, sir?' Lockton replied. "'We are at war, sir,' Bellingham said in a voice that all could hear. Several of the dock workers put down their burdens and stood up straight. "'Insults are the least of my concern. I'm more worried about the British invasion.' Lockton shrugged. "'I'm a merchant with cargo to sell. Search my crates, if you wish. Search the entire ship. You won't find the British fleet, I promise you. Those yellow-bellied cowards have sailed for Canada.' Bellingham took two steps and stood a fingertip away from Lockton. He lowered his voice. I don't have time for your games. The Committee of Safety suspects you a Tory. So Tory's another name for a loyalist supporting the king. In cahoots with Governor Tyron. You've come home to fight us who strive for freedom and liberty. All work on the ship stopped. The air had suddenly grown warm. I glanced sideways. The soldiers guarding the crates had picked up their guns. The clerks at the desk was the only one who seemed unrattled. He opened the ink bottle, dipped his pen, and scratched something across a blank page. I caught the boy behind the clerk, sparing a quick look at Ruth and me. His eyes were dark gray, the color of the sea during a storm. Freedom and liberty has many meetings, Lockton finally said. Am I free to return to my home? Shall I be at liberty from the improper meddling of your committee? Bellingham held his position a moment longer. Then he took one long step back searched the cargo, he commanded the soldiers, who laid down their weapons and picked up crowbars. Very well, Lockton said. Am I under arrest? Not until I find something, said Bellingham. Then I'm leaving. My wife is exhausted and needs me to accompany her home. Charles will stay and supervise. The round man sputtered twice, but didn't say a word. Enjoy your homecoming, Bellingham said. It may be short. The soldiers had started to go through the crates and call out the contents the clerk writing down the details in his big book. Lockton motioned with his elbow again. Come, dear, he said firmly. Madam refused to move. We cannot leave without my chest. Now, wife, he said, it will be sent along. It travels with me, Madam said crisply. Mr. Bellingham. Bellingham bent over the clerk's inventory book, looked up. Ma'am, does your batter for liberty entitle you to search through the private linens of a lady? The dock fell silent again. So she's saying, basically, that she has her underwear in this chest. The dock fell silent again. It was one thing for a gentleman to threaten another with the rest. The topic of a lady's linens was delicate. Bellingham cleared his throat and stood up straight. Well, uh, the rules. Do I gather, sir, from your hesitation, that you are unsure of the etiquette involved? Perhaps you're, you lack the proper authority. She carefully set herself on the walnut chest in question. Oh, Anne, please. Lockton groaned. Do not do this, my dear. Madam ignored him. I demand that Mr. Bellingham write to his Congress in Philadelphia. If they give him permission for common soldiers to rifle through my personal goods, then I will surrender. Until that letter comes, I shan't move. I shall guard my dignity day and night. Charles shifted nervously from foot to foot. Lockton pinched the space where his nose met his forehead. The soldiers studied the tips of their boots. Bellingham muttered something impolite, and the boy standing behind the clerk fought hard not to smile. My own lips twitched. A woman defending her underclothes from a battalion of soldiers was comical. I didn't dare laugh, of course. But Ruth did. She giggled. A sound like a small silver bell. 
a bell tolling disaster. Madame Lockton flew off the chest and pointed her finger at us. Which one of you made that noise? Her face flushed with rage, her eyes darting back and forth between us. I did, ma'am, I quickly lied. The smile on Ruth's face faded as she figured that something was unfolding. Crack! Lightning struck from a blue sky. Madame slapped my face so hard it near threw me to the ground. The sound echoed off the stone-faced buildings. Ruth grabbed at my skirts and helped me stand straight again. She was confused but kept her mouth shut. Thank heavens. My cheek burned, but I fought back the hot tears and tried to swallow the lump in my throat. No one had ever slapped my face like that, not once in my whole life. Better me than Ruth. Better me than Ruth. Madam sat back on the wooden chest and looked calmly at her husband, as if nothing had happened. The soldiers all went about their business, one of them whistling. The only person who looked my way was the boy in the red hat. He kept his features frozen in a mask, but he swallowed hard. Lockton shrugged. You see, Bellingham, I don't have time for your war. I have enough battles in my own household. Bellingham sighed and waved at the soldier closest to where Madam sat. You there, carry the lady's belongings to her carriage. He did not mention me. I was already forgotten, dismissed. Though the outline of her palm and fingers still burned on my skin, for an instant I saw myself pushing her off the dock onto the water below, but I blinked twice and the vision vanished. I took Ruth by the hand. Madam rose gracefully. Thank you, Mr. Bellingham. Lockton offered his arm again to his wife, and this time she took it. Bellingham lifted his hat as they passed. Ruth and me trailed close behind. As we approached the carriage, the driver jumped down and opened the door. Lockton helped his wife as she stepped up and settled on the padded seat. "'Well done, my dear,' he murmured. "'Well done, indeed.' Madam blushed. "'Twas all your doing.' She smoothed her skirts. "'Put the little girl up with the driver.' "'What about the older one?' She leaned forward to stare at me, standing just behind the master. "'Send that one to fetch us some clean water. I doubt Becky has had word of our arrival yet.' Lockton looked puzzled. "'How will she know where to find the pump, or how to get home, for that matter?' Charles will find someone to assist her. I'll take her, sir. Lockton turned around. The boy had removed his red hat and bowed politely. I'm Kirsten, sir, Mr. Bellingham's boy. My master needs me to fetch new quills up at Vandwater Street. I could show your girl the way. The driver and the soldier had finished strapping the walnut chest to the back of the carriage. The driver spoke gently to Ruth and took her by the hand to meet the horses. She giggled and went eagerly. Lockton studied the boy, then looked over to Bellingham, who was inspecting one of the open crates with a nervous Charles by his side. "'Excellent idea, madam,' said madam. "'You know where our house is, Lockton?' asked Kirsten. "'One of the proudest in our city, sir,' the boy answered, as he put his hat back on his head. With him standing this close, I could see the gold ring in his right ear, like a pirate's, and a long, thin scar that ran along the left side of his chin. South side of Wall Street, just past Smith.' Lockton grunted and glared at me. Be quick at your business. No dawdling, understand? I curtsied, bewildered at the speed of all of it. Yesterday I had been aboard a ship. The day before that, sold in a tavern. The day before that, I woke up in my own bed and watched as an old woman died. My belly ached again, as if I were still at sea, and the waves were throwing me off balance. Well, Lockton demanded. Yes, sir, I whispered. He looked at his wife. This one might be simple, too. He climbed into the carriage closed the door, and rapped at the ceiling with his knuckles. Go, driver. The carriage rolled away, Ruth sitting up straight with a big grin, the golden horses tossing their manes, hooves flashing in the sunshine. She waved to me as they drove away. I bent down, dipped my fingers in a puddle, and scrubbed the spot where that woman hit me. Whew. So they're not even considering what it's like for a person to come to a new city. And the wife is, oh my goodness, don't you just hate her? Ah! So, um, if you had to make a prediction, what sneaky business did they get away with? Because clearly there was something they were hiding. Mm. We're going to find out in future chapters. My voice is getting a little sore, so I'm going to take a break, but I'll come back to reading a little later. I hope you guys um, have a good rest of your day if I don't see you. Bye.